right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for the first spring webinar, kicking off our spring 2023 Infectious Disease and Climate Change webinar series. Um, we took a bit of a break, but it feels good to be back and to see many familiar names joining us today and to be welcoming some new names as well. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that the Canadian Public Health Association's office is situated on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And I am currently tuning in from the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat. They have been the guardians of this land for a millennia, and we are grateful for the example their stewardship provides. CPHA is committed to working with all First Nations, Inuit, and Metis peoples and their governments in realizing meaningful truth and reconciliation. Today's webinar, Surveillance of Neglected Mosquito and Tick-Borne Pathogens in Southern Manitoba, is brought to you by the Canadian Public Health Association through the Infectious Disease and Climate Change Project. Our webinar series aims to explore current and emerging infectious disease and climate change topics to share knowledge, research, and best practices. I'm Maddie Schuler, Project Officer with CPHA, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I want to take a quick minute to show everyone a couple of the winning posters from CPHA's 2022 Infectious Disease and Climate Change Grade 6 Poster Contest because our 2023 contest is currently underway. So this is an opportunity for teachers and students to learn more about climate change and the impact it's having on the spread of infectious disease like Lyme disease and West Nile virus in our communities. Students across Canada can submit a hand-drawn poster to bring attention to a climate-sensitive infectious disease for a chance to win a Chromebook and other great prizes. So the deadline this year is March 31st, which is only a couple weeks away. Um, and you can see all eight winning posters from both 2021 and 2022 at cpha.ca forward slash contest. And stay tuned because about mid to late spring, we'll, be, we'll have some 2023 winners up there as well. A few quick housekeeping notes. If you have any questions for our presenter today or technical difficulties, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, if uh, a lot of people are experiencing the same technical difficulty, I will just pause the webinar to address it. Um, but as for questions, we're gonna hold those until the end. Um, and after the presentation, I will read out the questions and our presenter will answer them. And we do strongly encourage attendee participation and look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions today. Secondly, our webinar is being recorded and will be made available on CPHA's YouTube channel a few days after the end of this presentation and presentation slides will be circulated as well. Lastly, we would love to get your feedback. So after the webinar, please fill out our five minute survey, which will open automatically in your browser once you close Zoom. Um, and I do truly read every piece of feedback and your thoughts and suggestions help and have helped to make these webinars what they are today. Now I would like to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Dr. Bernadette Ardelli is an accomplished biologist, researcher, and esteemed female leader in science. She is an expert in diseases that impact poor and marginalized populations. Since completing her PhD in zoology in 2000, she has achieved progressively senior leadership roles, including her current position as professor of biology and dean of science at Brandon University. Her expertise, dedication, and leadership has resulted in numerous high-profile and impactful appointments to local and national scientific committees. Dr. Ardelli is committed to change and inclusion in the sciences. She is a strong mentor and role model for students and faculty. She is authentic, knowledgeable, passionate, and a well-respected STEMinist. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ardelli. Thank you so much um, for that introduction. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. How's that looking? Good? Looks great. Wonderful, thank you. Brandon University has campuses located on Treaty 1 and Treaty 2 lands. In the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge that I have the privilege to live, work, and play on Treaty 2 lands. These are the traditional homelands of the Dakota, Cree, Oji Cree, Anishinaabe, Dene, and the Red River Métis people. So I would like to sort of put a disclaimer out there before I get into um, uh, the formal talk today. Um, so I, as I was telling Maddie earlier, I agonized over preparing this presentation because I'm trying to put together uh, two years worth of data. It was uh, two years of an intensive study looking at ticks and mosquitoes. We have hundreds of thousands of 
uh, insect samples, on top of that millions upon millions of genomic data that had to be sorted through. So it really, really was a team effort. Um, I am not an expert in everything that I'm going to talk about today. Um, there really was a, a large group of people that helped with this project. So hopefully uh, I've been able to distill the important information and that <clears throat> my team isn't going to be embarrassed by, uh, by my performance today. So um, in terms of climate change, what this uh, image is showing is the um, observed annual mean temperature across the globe between 1991 to 2020. Um, the bars are showing the, the, um, the mean temperature. So uh, with the darker sort of blues, we're talking cooler and moving up into warmer temperatures in 2021. So ranging from minus 50 to plus uh, 50. And it's showing the observed temperatures across the globe. Um, so uh, North America, of course, on the, the sort of cooler sides. But the point of this is that the mean global temperature has increased uh, one degree Celsius above what were pre-industrial levels. So in terms of climate change, it is going to present a challenge for vector-borne disease prevention and control. And in terms of climate change, with the impact we would expect to see would be decreased numbers of cold days and nights with increased warm days and nights. We might see increased extreme heat events, uh, decreased snow cover, accelerated sea level rise. Uh, we are seeing greater warming over land than oceans with the greatest uh, warming occurring in the Arctic. What this image below is showing is the change in surface temperature from present in degrees Celsius. So looking at 21,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, and what's predicted to be in about another, I don't know, 25 to 50 years. Again, cool, represented by the blue with moving into the sort of reds and orange um, showing warmer. So we can see that, of course, um, we have um, increased uh, global temperature and is predicted to continue to increase. In terms of climate change, um, some of the more extreme weather-related events that we're seeing include floods, uh, heat waves, drought, hurricanes, wildfires, as well as a loss of glacial ice. So in terms of vectors, how is this going to impact vectors? Well, again, we're having this warming of the earth uh, brought on by anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. So the image that I'm showing here is um, sort of more typical for industrialized uh, nations. Um, and this will have long-term implications if we don't do something to mitigate the effects of climate change, keeping in mind that vectors are ectotherms and they are going to do better in a warmer world. This image that I'm showing here, I borrowed from the World Health Organization, but basically it's outlining what the World Health Organization considers to be global threats. And there are, I think, 13 um, diseases listed here. With this image, it's showing a map of the world. Uh, the disease is highlighted by a color as well as the vector that transmits it. So in the case of malaria, as an example, we have this sort of light orange color showing the number of people at risk, cases per year, deaths per year, as well as the major vectors. So in terms of North America, uh, vectors that we need to be concerned about are shown here uh, that transmit uh, the pathogen that causes Japanese encephalitis, lymphatic filariasis, as well as some ticks um, transmitting the pathogen that causes Lyme disease and Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. There are also a number of uh, diseases that the World Health Organization classifies as more of a regional threat. So in the case of African trypanosomiasis, um, the rule has always been, you know, as long as the setsi fly, which is the major vector for transmitting uh, the pathogen that causes the disease, as long as it's contained to Africa, uh, we should be okay. And um, as far as I know, there haven't been um, natural cases of setsis occurring outside of Africa. There were some labs 
back in the 70s that did, of course, have SETSI colonies, which was very brave of them. Um, in terms of regional threats that we're familiar with, of course, Lyme disease, West Nile fever, and then some tick-borne encephalitis. In terms of how climate change may impact uh, vector-borne diseases, well, it's going to, um, basically it could impact the transmission dynamics. So if, um, for example, the world is getting warmer and it's uh, creating better habitats for these vectors, then we can expect uh, geographic spread of these vectors. And so we may see a reemergence of vector-borne diseases through multiple pathways, including some that uh, were originally thought to be under control. So we may see direct effects on the pathogen, the vector itself, so non-human hosts that maybe harbor the pathogen coming into areas that were perhaps not hospitable before, as well as uh, direct effects on humans. So in terms of ecosystem habitats, we or at least I have a tendency to think about sort of more rural type habitats, but we also need to be uh, aware of impacts that it might have on urban habitats. So, you know, pools of water collecting that might make uh, an area more hospitable for vectors that are going to transmit some of these pathogens. And so again, with, um, you know, altering ecosystems, the vectors or the non-human hosts may thrive in these environments or they may also fail as well. Once again, reminding you that vectors are ectotherms, so um, they prefer and do better in warmer climates. And so an increase in temperature will result in an increase in abundance of these vectors. They're doing better longer survival, increased feeding activity, um, and then it could also impact the rate of development of the pathogen within the vector itself. So using dengue as an example, the extrinsic incubation period, so that is the time when the pathogen gets ingested by the vector and when that vector actually becomes, um, or it becomes infective, so when the vector takes a blood meal. Um, it's inversely associated with um, ambient temperature. And so in terms of vector-borne disease, the key is whether or not the vector is going to become competent or capable of transmitting that infection. So it may not become competent if the rate of the development of the pathogen is extremely slow within that vector, or the survival of the vector is too short so that it becomes um, it dies before it becomes infective. But again, if we have increases in temperature, it's going to increase the survival of these vectors um, as well as the, their feeding activity, how many times they're going to go out and feed. And so that will have an impact on the competence of that vector if they are harboring a pathogen. So in terms of how these vectors are going to be dispersed into non-endemic localities, well, through trade, travel, or migration. And in terms of the vectorial capacity, so that is, you know, is this vector actually capable of transmitting the uh, pathogen that ultimately results in disease, we, we, we have to integrate a lot of information about that vector. So how much is there, the abundance of it? What, are, what, is, what does it need to survive? Um, the competence of the vector. So can it actually uh, transmit that pathogen, the feeding rate? So is it one blood meal? Does it need several blood meals in order to be able to transmit that pathogen? And again, how long that intrinsic incubation period is going to be. And all of this is going to be dependent on the uh, temperature conditions. So looking at some examples of regional local signals of climate change and the impact that it's having on vector-borne diseases, um, using Lyme disease as an example. So in the US, there are higher cumulative growing uh, degree days, lower cumulative precipitation, and a lower saturation deficit. All of this has been associated with an earlier start to the Lyme disease season. In Southern Canada, uh, we're seeing again higher temperatures, um, and the higher temperature is an important determinant for the environmental suitability for exodes, which is the tick vector, for Lyme disease and the ability of that vector to be able to establish itself. 
in Quebec, we're seeing milder and shorter winters. Um, and this is associated with the spread of the white-footed mouse north uh, to the north. And this is the primary reservoir for the pathogen that uh, causes Lyme disease. In terms of um, mosquito-borne disease and climate change, um, there are sort of five major players with respect to um, mosquito-borne uh, pathogens. Uh, so the pathogen that causes malaria, dengue, lymphatic filariasis, yellow fever, and Japanese encephalitis. Just in terms of these five main mosquito-borne uh, pathogens, over 300 um, million infections per year with a global disease burden of 50 million dailies. And so we can expect that mosquito-borne disease will continue to exact increasing tolls on public health. Within Canada, Public Health Agency of Canada, um, there's a 10% increase in mosquito-borne disease observed between 1999 to 2019. And so we can expect this to continue to increase if climate change um, continues to go um, unmitigated. So for example, if we look uh, specifically at Manitoba and what we're seeing um, to the north, uh, rising permafrost temperatures and thinning ice, we're seeing more forest fires um, around the, the lake areas, uh, changing ecological conditions, more extreme weather events with significantly less snow cover. And we also have um, greater risks of flooding and, and more flooding occurring. Um, so in terms of the impact that climate change might have on Manitoba, well, we're centrally located in North America, so we have a very northerly latitude, and because of that, it's expected that we'll face earlier and more severe changes to climate than in many other parts of the world. Already, uh, temperatures in northern Canada are two to three degrees Celsius higher than they would normally be at this time. So with climate change, we will expect to see warmer and wetter winters, longer, warmer, and drier summers. Precipitation is going to vary more from year to year, and extreme weather events will become more common. So heat waves, drought, flood, as well as um, intense storms. So uh, with that introduction, I want to start to talk about uh, some of the work we've done looking at uh, mosquito and tick-borne pathogens in southern Manitoba um, with an eye on uh, thinking about climate change and how this might impact uh, some of these uh, pathogens. It's predicted that southern Manitoba will experience dramatic climate changes by 2050, and this, of course, is likely to increase the burden of infectious diseases. Um, we, we do have a number of tick and mosquito species that are ubiquitous in the province that are capable of transmit, transmitting medically important pathogens. So the question is, you know, are these medically important pathogens present in the province? And um, currently, um, these are neglected, so to speak, in provincial surveillance programs. So while we do surveil for West Nile and Lyme, we do not survey for uh, bunyavirus virus encephalitis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, or tularemia. And I point out these three uh, medically important um, infections because they've been found detected either within Manitoba or in neighboring states. In terms of West Nile and Lyme disease, I kind of have an asterisk there and I've got COVID um, in, in brackets. And so um, because of my role at the university, um, I, as I was telling Maddie earlier, I get a lot of information that I may not need to, to hear about. But I, I, what I'm hearing a lot are a number of people who, for various reasons, and because of COVID, maybe ignored um, certain health conditions, maybe symptoms that they are experiencing because of this um, you know, added pressure brought on by COVID. And so I, I wonder, um, are we going to see impacts on you know, currently surveilled um, infections like West Nile and Lyme disease or some of these others that are neglected? because of COVID. And so um, I'm sort of watching and waiting to see what the impact of that is really going to be on um, medically important diseases other than COVID. 
So within Manitoba, we have over 50 mosquito species that belong to uh, six main genera, which are listed here. I won't read them to you because I'm pretty sure everyone can read. Uh, but uh, Culix and Aedes are probably two of the, the more predominant ones at this time in Manitoba. So I've got three species of neglected mosquito vectors listed here, and I say they're neglected uh, simply because we, we don't really understand much about them in terms of important factors like abundance, um, things like weather that might drive the abundance. So, you know, precipitation, humidity, uh, um, uh, heat, like what might drive their abundance. We don't know what microbes are harbored by these uh, vectors. And then uh, as well, unless it's West Nile virus microbes and Culix, um, non-West Nile, non Nile vial microbes are not uh, characterized. So that's what I mean in terms of their, their, their neglected, so to speak. And so as part of this study, one of the things we wanted to look at was uh, mosquito activity and seasonal population dynamics, because we really wanted to try and identify what weather variables might be driving that mosquito activity. Um, so just to sort of give you a little bit about how we went about doing this. So we use CDC traps for mosquitoes. Um, in terms of you know, the teamwork, we, we had, I, I don't know, a small army of undergraduate students that would go out into the field. I collect, identify, catalog, and sort hundreds of thousands of samples. Um, we had to prepare some RNA for um, genome sequencing, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And then I'll also talk in a bit more detail about our uh, process for analysis of that sequence data. So in terms of the mosquito study, we had collections uh, across two years um, in 2020 and 2021. So 2020, there were 19 mosquito traps set uh, up across Western Manitoba between June and September. So in that first year, we had almost 150,000 mosquitoes collected from 17 communities with the majority of these uh, trapped from July to about mid-August. In 2021, Eight traps were set up again across Western Manitoba between May and September, and slightly more than 100,000 mosquitoes from 17 communities. <clears throat> I would like to point out that 78% of those mosquitoes that were trapped are capable of transmitting pathogens to humans. We ran into a bit of trouble with our 2021 sampling because uh, fogging was done. And so you'll see when I show you the data that our, our numbers kind of drop off, but that's because of fogging. So what this uh, graph here is showing is the uh, weekly average of mosquitoes that we caught in 2020 and 2021. So along the y-axis, number of mosquitoes, along the x-axis is the CDC week, it, the blue bars represent 2020 samples and red 2021. So you can see that the bulk of the samples were uh, collected in mid July, July into mid August. And uh, as I said, in 2021, there was fogging, so it impacted our collection season. What these two graphs here are showing are the uh, number and species of mosquitoes that were collected. So here on the left is 2021. Along the y-axis is the weekly total number of mosquitoes. And then the CDC week is along the x-axis. Within each of the bars, what uh, it represents are the number for each different species of mosquito, which are color coded. So for example, in blue is Aedes vexans, uh, the orange is Culix tarsalis. And so it gives you a pretty good visual of um, the, the species and what CDC week they were most predominant. Uh, some general observations, Aedes vexans was found pretty much throughout the study with the bulk of it being collected in CDC week 28. Looking at 2021, again, the graph is set up uh, in a similar manner. And again, we saw Aedes vexans for the most part throughout. And then we had some uh, uh, perturbans as well. 
And as I said, we had fogging later on, and so that impacted um, the collection. So looking at the specific communities and the distribution of the mosquito species. Um, so to orient you here, this is a map uh, showing Western Manitoba and the locations where we collected samples. Um, where you see two pi charts, that means that we had samples collected in those communities in 2020 and 2021. The color coding on the pie corresponds to the mosquito species. So for example, Aedes vexans is in this blue color, uh, Canadensis in black. Um, here to the east, starting with Portage La Prairie. Um, so the, uh, the asterisk, this means that those collections did not include uh, Culex tarsalis uh, because they were removed by the city of Winnipeg insect control branch. So including Portage La Prairie and then into Winnipeg. So all of these communities here. Um, some uh, species we did not find in 2020. And then in 2021, we collected one uh, Triceratus and that's not shown in the figure. So generally speaking, uh, just some general points, the bulk of the mosquitoes trapped were, um, I would say predominantly Aedes vexans. Um, but some interesting differences, particularly here in Cypress River, where there were uh, very little ADS vaccines trapped in comparison to the other communities. Um, so, as I said, we were trying to figure out, you know, relationships between mosquito activity and, uh, you know, weather conditions that might be conducive to their survival. And so um, generalized linear mix models were used to look at uh, differences in mosquito activity between uh, communities and time. And then as well, the relationship between the mosquito activity, temperature, precipitation, and relative humidity. So we did this for uh, a number of mosquito species. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to show you all this data, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of how we went about this. So with this particular chart here along the y-axis, you're looking at trap count and then um, week uh, along the x-axis. And the week corresponds to the week of the year for 2020 and 2021. So for example, week 24, would be the 24th week of both 20 and 2021. These lines that you're seeing are the modeled lines that we use to, um, again, try to predict weekly trap count, in this case, degree days. And we use the 14 day mean. The color corresponds to um, degree days and so temperature. So, uh, darker shading, lower temperature, and then a lighter shading getting into orange means a, a higher temperature. The circles, uh, this is actual data. So these are the trapping events. And so the larger the circle, the greater the trapping event. So small circle, say here, would be one trapping event, and then the larger circle, 10 trapping events. So we did this uh, for degree days, also for relative humidity. So a graph is set up the same way, except that relative humidity uh, from 50 to 80% relative humidity and a lighter color, sort of the orange around 50% and the sort of more purpley color, 80% uh, humidity. Same thing for precipitation between zero to 200 millimeters of precipitation. And again, trapping events shown by the circle. So this is actual data. So to sort of put all of this together, what did we find out? Um, we trapped uh, approximately 270,000 mosquitoes in 2020 and 2021 between the months of June and August. There were linear as well as nonlinear relationships between uh, four of the mosquito species that were the ones that were most um, abundant and temperature, precipitation, and relative humidity. In terms of some interesting results, um, there were temporal and location differences. Um, so for vexans and dorsalis, the numbers were highest at moderate temperatures. 
and there are more Tarsalis mosquitoes caught in warmer temperatures. The relative humidity was positively correlated with all four mosquito species. Um, and there was a relationship with precipitation only for Aedes vexans. So how could all of this be helpful? Well, um, it's going to be helpful for us to understand how mosquitoes in Manitoba are going to be responding to weather variables as well as uh, climate change. And this may help us uh, improve effectiveness of mosquito and arborvitae uh, surveillance programs. So we can understand uh, the conditions better for these um, mosquitoes, then maybe we can um, you know, perhaps put in uh, more preventative measures. So the first part of this study was to look at the conditions, uh, the weather and climate that these mosquitoes uh, seem to thrive best in. But then we also wanted to look at um, what are the potential pathogens that are contained within these mosquitoes. And so we did that by looking at the transcriptome of these uh, various mosquito species. Okay. I'm not going to explain all of this, uh, but if you if you want to, you know, I think these this is being recorded and the presentation will be available. So this kind of gives you some detailed information about how we went about doing this. Um, so we used total RNA and we did uh, RNA sequencing. And so again, in order to get enough RNA to be able to create these uh, libraries, uh, we made RNA pools. So they, we combined by species, year, and location to form larger pools that represented between 50 and 2,000 mosquitoes. Um, so once the RNA was extracted, met the quality control, we sent it to the Genome Quebec Innovation Center for creation of the uh, cDNA libraries, adapter tagging, and the RNA sequencing. And we did this using, or they did this using the NovaSeq platform. Um, for analysis, uh, we used the Illumina analysis packages available through uh, Genome Quebec. Um, so in terms of how we uh, prepared um, or analyzed the libraries, we had to do a number of quality filters using the Zuckerberg metagenomic pipeline. We had to assemble um, the contigs uh, using uh, spades. And then of course, we did a number of uh, blast analyses to try and figure out um, <clears throat> what we had. And then we had different filters uh, for the blast. Um, in terms of novel viruses, uh, we performed uh, phylogenetic analysis using maximum likelihood trees. And then, of course, to determine the specific California serogroup viruses, we screened using uh, RT, PCR, and uh, specific primers. So, what you're looking at here uh, is the mosquito transcriptome. So, we, we pulled samples, and so we had 45 samples representing almost 5 million viral reads. And so the way this graph is set up, we have viral reads here along the x-axis in log scale. The color-coded bars uh, correspond to genome type. So is it a uh, single-stranded RNA? Is it a double-stranded RNA or single-stranded uh, DNA? And then along the x-axis, we have the, uh, the taxon or the viral family that, um, that they belong to. Um, so I just want to point out that um, not all um, 45 samples produced uh, viral reads. Um, and in some cases, so for example, miscellaneous picorna virals, um, so we sort of put them in there because they had no family or genus that they corresponded to. So we just sort of put it as miscellaneous. Um, so yeah, so this is, these are the results that we, we found. Um, and then looking at the number of viruses in all samples, so we found 33 viruses. So again, the taxon shown here along the x-axis, number of viruses along the y. 
And then again, the color-coded bars correspond to the specific uh, genome type. Was it, again, single-stranded RNA, double-stranded, or single-stranded um, DNA? So just to sort of orient you here, the majority, I guess if you can bear all the samples, were the rhabdoviridae. Um, in addition to viral samples, we did find uh, non-host and non-viral reads. Uh, so again, the reads are here uh, on a non-log scale and then showing the specific taxon that they belong to. So again, color-coded, black, uh, referring to bacteria, uh, sort of this, I guess, magenta color, fungi, and then in the pale yellow, uh, certain parasites. Um, so within the parasites uh, corresponding to AP complexin, duglinozoa, as well as some nematodes. So they weren't all viral reads that we detected. Um, in terms of California sero group, uh, we, we screened this using uh, RT-PCR. In 2020, we examined 30 pools of mosquito uh, RNA that represented just under 20,000 mosquitoes. And one of those pools tested positive for the presence of a California sero group virus. And it was a pool of ADIS vexans that was caught in August. Um, we have not been able to determine the specific viral species. In 2021, we looked at 67 pools of mosquito RNA that represented just over 16,000 mosquitoes. And again, one pool tested positive for the presence of a California Sierra group virus. And it was once again an ADIS vexans that was caught in week 30. And in this case, we were able to determine that it was a Cache Valley virus. So in terms of where we found these uh, California Sierra group viruses, so remember in 2020, it was uh, detected, but we were unable to determine the specific uh, viral species, but it was actually caught in Brandon, uh, shown here, in um, ADAS vexan species. In terms of the Cache Valley virus that was identified in 2021, it was caught in a shoal lake here and again in an ADIS vexan species. So in terms of sort of trying to put all of this information together, um, so we did a two year very intensive surveillance program to try and identify pathogens harbored by mosquitoes in Manitoba. And we did this using metatranscriptomics. So 45 mosquito samples were uh, surveyed representing about 30,000 mosquitoes and identified a total of 33 viruses. Uh, some of public, potential public health concern, some of economic and environmental concern, and some that have been newly reported in North America. There are seven viruses that uh, we think are probably novel and that they haven't been detected as being harbored by mosquitoes in Manitoba. But we also identified other uh, non-viral uh, species, including protozoans, fungi, bacteria, as well as blood and nectar meal sources. And again, for two of the mosquito pools, we did detect California Sierra group viruses, one of which was determined to be a Cache Valley virus. So in terms of uh, viruses of uh, potential public health concern, uh, Chu virus and lacrosse virus, some novel to the region, Iflovirus and Caflugovirus, a veterinary or agricultural concern, Turlock virus, and then some that are um, can impact some economically or environmentally important insects. So black queen cell virus, potentially impacting um, honeybees, and Bog Hill Burn Virus. I just love the way they name viruses, great names. Um, so in terms of where we're going to go uh, with this mosquito study, um, we trapped the mosquitoes using CDC miniature light traps with carbon dioxide. That's the standard. Um, and it's, it's very useful for a variety of reasons. But we are aware of the fact that um, there could be some potential bias in the study just based on the type of trap that we used because certain traps are more attractive to some mosquito species than to others. 
Um, also, of course, we want to deploy these traps in different habitats. So looking at swamps and urban areas and woodland areas, but also keeping in mind that the mosquitoes that are attracted to the traps are probably those that are going out to you know, get a blood meal because those that have already had their blood meal are more likely to be in, you know, bushes or grass or sort of more protected area while they're digesting that blood meal. So um, we, that's what, part of the reason why we want to set these traps in different areas so we can get a really good sense of, um, of what's actually happening within that mosquito um, ecosystem. And again, using different types of traps. So the CBC light trap, as well as a gravid trap. And then of course, you can't account for everything, but there are some other variables that we would like to consider as well. So, you know, wind speed, uh, moonlight, and perhaps human light sources in the areas where we've been doing our collection, just to try and make this an even, you know, better and more robust study than, it, than, uh, than what we currently did. So I'm looking at my clock and I think I have enough time to sort of throw in uh, some of the work that we did on these uh, tick vectors. Uh, the mosquito study is more complete than the, the, the tick study, but basically uh, we used a very similar approach. Um, so in terms of tick sampling, um, we looked at rural uh, municipalities shown in green, as well as uh, three urban centers indicated by the red star. So Brandon, Winnipeg, as well as um, Winkler. So with the ticks, we uh, dragged for those ticks. And again, army of students to identify, catalog, and sort. And then using a similar approach with uh, uh, extracting RNA and sending these uh, to Genome Quebec for cDNA library preparation, RNA sequencing. And then there was, again, um, sequence data analysis as well. So we collected the American dog tick, Dermacenter variabilis, uh, and we collected again across two seasons. In 2020, uh, 15 locations uh, with 4,500 ticks obtained. And then in 2021, we only sampled uh, 10 locations because of uh, fire. And so we weren't able to go back to uh, the same communities. And we collected about 3,000 ticks before the, the fire um, ended our collection season. So this uh, bar graph is just showing you the, the locations of where we uh, collected those ticks. And on average, we collected, uh, you know, at least 300 ticks within each of these different communities. And some communities had, were more tick rich than others. Um, so again, using a similar approach uh, that we used with the uh, mosquito metagenomic data, same process with the tick data. Um, and again, detected a number of bacterial as well as viral species. Um, and the analysis for uh, 2021 is still ongoing. Um, so um, I just like to take this opportunity to thank uh, a number of people that were involved uh, in this project. Um, I don't really do lab work, bench work anymore. I'm sort of the bank and I you know, go to student defenses, ask, silly questions and, you know, get on their case about, about things in general. But um, there were some great students involved in this project. Uh, the mosquito work, the bulk of that was uh, Cole Barrel, tick work, A's and A, um, and then of course, Cody Koloski. I just wanna put in a plug, a Vanier scholarship um, recipient, great job, and Yvonne. And then of course, the whole army of students that went out and collected and cataloged and sorted. Um, and then, of course, our funding agencies, NSERC, uh, this work was funded by Public Health Agency of Canada, Infectious Disease and Climate Change Fund. And then we had help from Manitoba Health with trapping supplies and access to trapping sites, as well as the uh, Winnipeg Insect Control Branch for um, providing specimens. Okay, I was 32 seconds over time. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ardelli. That was wonderful. I was going to say you were right on time. <laughs> so thank you so much. That was that was well done. Um, at this point, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A box. Um, and I do believe we have a couple 
to begin with. Um, first Hopefully question. I can answer them. Yeah. <laughs> first question. Um, climate change will make Manitoba look and feel at some other present southern locals locales in the U.S. What is the present level of mosquitoes and the viral loads, as well as incidence of mosquito transmitted diseases in the U.S. where climate is similar to what will be in Manitoba and how that compares with present the present situation in Manitoba? That's quite a question. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, um, I can't answer that off the top of my head. Um, I will say that, you know, we've um, in terms of um, medically important pathogens, we are seeing um, in North Dakota, so closest to us, that's where we're starting to see um, some of the, the pathogens that I mentioned um, that we haven't seen in Manitoba yet. But um, yeah, so I can, I can still uh, send you information that you can post, correct? So I, yes, can, yep. I can actually look into that. Absolutely. Yes. And I will put um, my email in the chat for anyone who has any questions after the presentation. Um, I'd be happy to connect you with Dr. Ardelli. Um, but thank you. We do have a couple more questions coming in. Um, apologies if I missed it. What was the reason for using less traps in your 2021 sampling season? 17 in 2020 down to eight in 2021, if I'm remembering correctly. Thank you. Uh... I'm trying to remember and don't quote me on this and I'm starting and I'm wondering if it was accessibility to sites as well as accessibility to traps. Um, you know, with COVID, we also had issues getting access to vehicles uh, mm -hmm. that we needed to get into some of these sites like it was impossible to rent trucks and vans um, within this province. So we had a, a real issue there. Uh, one more question coming in. You mentioned collecting American dog ticks. Were there any black-legged ticks collected during your survey? Yes, there were. I cannot tell you uh, how many, um, but they're in the freezer. So if, if I'm invited <laughs> back again, um, we're, as I said, we're still working through the, the tick study. Mm -hmm. And um, so hopefully that information will be more complete. There is some interesting stuff going on with the ticks as well. No, we'd be happy to have you back. Whenever <laughs> you have that information, please, we'd, we'd love to have you back. Um, Especially because we collected ticks and mosquitoes in roughly the same area. So we mm -hmm. have the, the climate information for those days because we sort of sent them out as a team and they divvied up mosquito versus tick. Right. Um, yeah. So we can do some interesting work interesting. with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, wondering how interconnected you think these mosquito communities are. If a new virus was to arrive here or move from the States, do you think the communities have enough overlap here in Manitoba for said viruses to become endemic? Uh, I, I think so. Um, we, we have a number of vectors here that are, are they're established here that are capable of, we know that they transmit these pathogens in other locales. And so we already have an abundance of these vectors here. Um, so perhaps with the right conditions, will it happen overnight? Obviously not. Um, my concern is always, of course, when do we find out that it's endemic when it's already established in the human population and we're having problems. Um, it would be nice if we could sort of keep looking at this um, in the mosquito populations. And personally, I think we should also maybe expand to some of the reservoirs to see if um, they're picking up, uh, if they're harboring these infections as well. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps there might be some of a, a delay, uh, COVID, uh, again, because of our the way we had to isolate and choose who was going to be part of our bubble, particularly in Manitoba. I felt like we were quite uh, draconian with how we um, responded to, to the virus. Um, there might be a delay perhaps, um, but yeah. But I, I think it's entirely possible. I mean, we've seen it. We've seen it happen over and over again. So right. um, 
I won't be surprised. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Is the main risk in North America associated with the emergence of new insect species that carry diseases or the introduction of diseases that can be harbored by endemic species? Uh, for me, I would say the greater risk right now is uh, endemic species that could potentially uh, become, uh, might be competent vectors. Mm -hmm. Very interesting talk. Thank you. In the, mosquito uh, in the mosquito activity statistical modeling, how did you choose the threshold for degree day? Was it zero degrees and why over 14 days? In brackets, I, I suspect these thresholds and duration periods vary from one species to another. Um, I will have to write that into uh, respond in the chat because that's part of a thesis and I have to go back and look at all of the specific variables for what they did and I can't remember off the top of my head um, okay. sorry as I said it's it's a lot of data um, that I tried to distill into um, a very small talk but I will actually send all that data what they did the variables that they chose okay wonderful thank you um, another question here on your models, did you include any covariable covariables related to land use uh, in brackets, urban, cropland, wetland? No, that I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And one last question here. Has the information been presented to the provincial and municipal governments in Manitoba so they can make evidence-based legislation and policies where climate change is a factor? Um, so, uh, provincially, locally, yes, um, because my, I forgot to, sorry, I forgot to introduce my co-investigator on this, Dr. Cassone. So he has connections and he speaks with them on a regular basis. And so they're aware of what we're doing. And then locally within Prairie Mountain Health, we have a, a collaborator that we, uh, we speak with as well. And so we're hopefully going to be uh, looking at um, uh, human uh, tissue samples um, because there's a fairly large collection and so we're just sort of getting through the paperwork and hopefully we can um, get access to those through our collaborator at the at the labs. Perfect yeah we do have about five more minutes for questions so I'm just gonna give a moment to anyone who's currently typing the chance to submit. Um, I guess I have a question is in a similar vein to the previous one because um, I know a good chunk of our audience at these webinars work within public health at the regional and local level. Um, how could local public health units apply these findings? Um, so in terms of I mean, generally as a citizen of Brandon, you know, I, people complain about the mosquitoes and they want fogging done, um, but they really don't sort of get into the specific mosquito species. A mosquito is a mosquito. Um, mm -hmm. But where we were able to see that, um, you know, certain mosquito species are more predominant in some areas, like I don't know what was going on in Cypress River that we had such a difference in the mosquito species that were predominant, but you know we see that Aedes vexans is the predominant species, and we know that that's the one that was um, positive for both of those um, viruses. Right. But I guess if we if we know now because we've modeled the different uh, sum of the climate conditions, so we could use those models to perhaps better predict and warn the general public, okay, mm -hmm. so we warmed up faster this year. So you might expect to see that this particular population will emerge earlier or it will have greater numbers. Um, so if we see that there was a drought, but, um, you know, so that that might be more informative in general, just to let the public know, like they might not, I don't think they will care about the specific species, right. but that we might see an earlier emergence in greater numbers. So just be vigilant and, um, you know, these are the areas where you might want to be aware. Right. Yeah. No, that risk communication piece, I think is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do have another question uh, related to my first question. If the principal risks are endemic insect species harboring new diseases, what are the mechanisms for these diseases to emerge in more northward climates? So if the, sorry. 
If the principal risks are endemic insect species harboring new diseases, what are the mechanisms for these diseases to emerge in more northward climates? Um, so I would say um, certainly the, the climate, the conditions that they need in order to, um, to establish, uh, to stick around longer, so to speak, um, you know, if the particular pathogen needs X number of days in order to develop or weeks potentially to develop in the vector. Um, and because of change in climate, that vector is actually able to stick around longer than we are, of course, um, allowing that particular pathogen to become established and the vector to become competent in mm -hmm. being able to um, transmit the pathogen. Um, again, if they're sticking around longer, greater chances to feed. Um, and again, I, I guess keep thinking about COVID. So I'm seeing more and more people like sort of celebrating, let's get together, let's, you know, um, you know, you're, you're bringing more people together um, and, you know, potentially um, allowing for um, easier transmission. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or even being, you know, yeah. we can all relate to being feeling locked in our houses during yep. COVID. So even just that, you know, new want and need to go outside more and um, spend time outdoors. Yeah. But even uh, with something like ticks, where, you know, we were allowed to go outside, that was kind of the one place where you could kind of, so you're out right. in nature. Like I hiked more in mm -hmm. the past three years than I've done in my 17 years in Manitoba. Right. So that's <laughs> yeah. also you know, impacting us as well. For sure. Another question here, does Manitoba use mosquito surveillance to control mosquitoes? Um, in to control as in, um, I'm not sure if, um, I they mean, they, they do survey, um, but most of the surveillance is for West Nile virus. So they mm -hmm. do survey for particular uh, mosquito species. And then um, they will fog uh, as well um, mm -hmm. if certain species are particularly abundant. Um, right, no, that makes sense. Um, is yeah. there any evidence that pathogens change with climate change? In the sense so that it becomes um, like the what pathogens we see or the pathogen itself maybe becomes more transmissible or potentially more virulent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I don't know of any specific case. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh. I mean, generally speaking, when an infection is new, you tend to see more virulence in terms of the pathogen. Um, but as it develops, unless it needs to kill a host to get to the next one, generally they're sort of evolving towards some sort of balance. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. no, that's an interesting question. Yeah, good question. Oh, I mean, all great questions. Um, one last one coming in. Should we use chemical control for mosquitoes? Uh, does do does fogging not reduce potential mosquito predators? Uh, so so for me to use chemical control, um, I prefer that we do not do that. Um, when I first moved to Manitoba, I had a colleague that. Um, did a lot of work uh, on mosquitoes. They've since retired, but my question was always because one of the uh, one of my specialties in terms of disease control is drug resistance, mm -hmm. and so I always sort of asked, well, does anybody monitor for insecticide resistance? Because of course, um, in other countries, particularly in Africa, where DDT was commonly used, of course, resistance mm -hmm. developed, and so so for me. Um, chemicals are perhaps a band-aid solution. I would prefer right. that we find other ways to, um, to control insects, but I get it. Even I, 
I'm happy when they fog because I want to sit outside. I want to, and then there's mosquitoes and my child won't leave the house because he doesn't want to get bit. And <laughs> so I, I don't like it, but it's what we have right now. And it's the, it's, it's fast and it's effective, but I think that we should look at, um, always be looking at other ways. Um, don't get complacent. Um, so I know in some cases that might be hard because there's so many problems to solve. And so if you have a chemical that's working well and it's it's doing its job, um, yeah, it, it's hard to not rely on it. Right. But, yeah. Right. Well, one o'clock again, great timing, Dr. Ardelli. Oh, well, <laughs> that thanks. brings us to the end of our webinar today. Thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you again, Dr. Ardelli, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Um, I just want to remind everyone to please fill out the survey that opens up when you close your browser. Um, I think there was a bit of an issue uh, with it before, but it should be resolved now. So we really appreciate your feedback. Um, our next webinar will be March 21st, titled uh, National Baseline Survey of Tick-Borne Disease Awareness. So we hope to see everyone there. Um, and thank you again and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. And I just like to say, if anybody yes. wants to contact me with more specific questions, I'm happy to, to answer them um, offline as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Ardelli. Thank Take you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.